Hey, uh, Casey, my friend. Casey DeFranco, 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 uh, is the last elder candidate to, to give his testimony. So, Casey, sweet wife Lisa. So, here you go, bud. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning. Uh, yeah, I get the, I guess, privilege of doing this all by myself. I, I don't know. Uh, it was a rough week last week, but I'm grateful to be here. My name is Casey DeFranco. I am a member here at Cornerstone, my wife and my children. Uh, we've been here since shortly after they opened up in Chippenville. I believe it was January or February of 2014 that we came out here. Um, it's just been a, a blessing and a privilege to serve here. But before coming to Cornerstone, I was not definitely always a Christian. I was brought up Catholic. I was born and raised in St. Mary's, Pennsylvania. My parents sent me to a parochial school for my first eight years. But when I left that school, I walked away from anything to do with faith. I didn't understand what it meant to me, and I, I didn't understand anything about Scripture or Jesus. So my teenage years and my 20s were plagued with addiction and also sickness. These things culminated. Um, you know, I, I, I graduated high school. I went to college. I ended up quitting college because of a few different reasons. Uh, every time I tried to get ahead in life, these two things came into factor and would knock me down. I met my wife along this line, and we got married in 2007. But yeah, um, sickness got worse in my life, and as my sickness got worse, addiction got worse, and these two things fed off each other. And in 2009, a week before my oldest daughter was born, I got a phone call on the way to work, and they told me that uh, they took an MRI in my brain, and it showed that I had multiple sclerosis. So I was not spiritually prepared for this news, and I re responded the way an addict responds as I started using drugs. I medicated. And I was in the pit of despair from 2009 to 2013. Uh, and if it wouldn't have been for my wife and the fact that we had two children along this time too. My, my oldest daughter was born in 2009 and my youngest in 2010. Uh, they were lights and they, they saved me from uh, what could have been horrible things. But anyway, um, Around 2013, I was suffering from horrible depression, and I medicated with addiction, which just escalated the depression. So I attempted to take my life, and it would have been about May of 2013, in a very vain uh, way of doing it. And it was through this attempt that I ended up at UPMC Presbyterian Hospital in Pittsburgh, and I was in a medically induced coma. Uh, they didn't know if I was going to survive. They told they prepared my wife that I wouldn't, uh, that I was going to lose my arm, and there was a great many things. I was, I'll spare the details of all that. But it was in this coma that I had my experience with God. Uh, when I was in the hospital, people prayed for me. There were multiple churches that I was on the prayer list for. There were recovery meetings. Uh, just people, I was getting cards left and right from people that I didn't even know. And this is what I attest my salvation to, is the power of prayer. Amen. My mother prayed for me my entire upbringing. Uh, she was Catholic, but she loved the Lord, and she, she prayed. Every time I would come home late at night, she was up praying for me. Um, so when I was in this coma, I don't know, I don't understand what happened. I, I feel I was in the presence of God. And when I woke up, something changed. God added something to my life that I did not have before. Uh, going into this coma... I did not have the desire to live. I didn't have the desire to keep putting forth effort, and uh, the enemy told me that my wife and children would be better off without me. But when I woke up, uh, they took the breathing tube out. My wife said a tear rolled down my face, and I said, I don't want to die. And that was the first uh, truthful thing I think I ever said and, and felt in my life. And I didn't quite accept Jesus, but something changed. God had a draw on my heart. And he brought me out of the hospital. He brought me through the physical therapies. He got me to a point where I was able to get off the medications they had me on. I sobered up from alcohol and drugs on August 1st of 2013. And uh, the Lord, re Lord restored my marriage. 
We were about ready to divorce when this was all taking place, but uh, she, my wife has a heart of mercy. So through her mercy, she uh, rekindled, God rekindled our marriage. And she started taking me to church. I was no longer resistant to it. I was open to it. And I came when we were in the building over there, and I heard the invitation at the end of the service. And it, it blew my mind. And the Holy Spirit came into my heart on March 16th of 2014. This was a time, amen, yeah, yeah. Yep. From the pit of despair to, to unexplainable joy. And this was a, about an 11-month period from the time in the hospital when my heart was quickened uh, to the Lord pulling me to the point that I finally accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And since then, uh, I've been clean and sober from drugs and alcohol since 2013, and my multiple sclerosis has been without a relapse since 2014 and 2015. There hasn't been any significant changes. So the Lord brought restoration in my life. When we came to Cornerstone... Uh, it wasn't just my plight and my troubles that were going on. They actually dissolved my wife's job at the university and laid her off. Uh, so she, we went through unemployment. She couldn't find a job. And we came here in dire straits. And people came out of the woodwork. And I found the, the generosity and the loving nature of, of God's people, of, of what a church does for people. And I, we were able to humble ourselves, and that's something that I suggest that if anyone's in, in need of help, to ask. Uh, that's what God's people, that's what we're here for. But now I'm at the position where we're doing good. And if God can use me to give back in any way, uh, who am I to, to go against that? Since then, I've been serving at Celebrate Recovery. Very soon after I came here, I, I found a place, and I found my forever family, as we say, in Celebrate Recovery. Uh, it gave me opportunity to sanctify myself by the truth, to grow as a Christian, to find mentors, and get to a point where I could mentor other people. Uh, it, it's the discipleship that we do there, and, and we help each other with our hurts, habits, and hang-ups, but it's ultimately to sanctify ourselves by the truth of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And through that, I've had ample opportunity to testify to what Jesus has done in my life. I've seen it work in multiple other people's lives. I've been able to speak at multiple churches. I've even had opportunity to preach sermons. There was even a church in Fairmont City I was able to preach at for almost two years. And it's all just a gift from Jesus, just being willing to serve and being willing to give back. So I'm, I'm grateful for all this. My, my children were baptized. They, they accepted Jesus through coming to Cornerstone and VBS. Uh, it's, it's just been an awesome experience. And I love serving the kingdom through Cornerstone. And as far as the nomination and everything that's going on with, with the, the elders, and, and I don't know. It's not something I asked for. I don't know uh, who nominated me. And when I was first called about it, I kind of had disbelief. Uh, I, th I think Russ, Russ Cotaldo, said, you know, if, if somebody else saw something and nominated me, who am I to go against that? So I don't know if I'm right for the position. I have no idea, but I trust in God's will. And I trust in the voting, and I trust in all you guys. And if I am nominated, I will serve to the best of my ability. And if not, that's, that's fine, too. I will keep serving at the capacity that Jesus wants me to. Uh, so, yeah, I do. I, I look forward to the question and answer and uh, all the voting, and that's my story. Thank you. Casey just gave you, in a nutshell there for a moment, as concise a, a um, recitation of what we believe salvation is all about. We're convicted by the Holy Spirit. When we respond to that, when we become open to that, the Holy Spirit quickens us. That, that he makes us alive to God. And, and he is in that process of pulling us to himself. And then when we recognize our need for salvation and we humble our hearts, ask Jesus to be our Savior instantly. Jesus comes to live within us through the person of the Holy Spirit. Great job, Casey, wherever you are over there. Hey, turn 
in your Bibles, if you will, to Jeremiah chapter 1. And when you find that, uh, go to Genesis chapter 1. And put your finger there at Jeremiah. And guys, I'm bringing a sermon this morning on the sanctity of human life. If statistics are right, and I believe there are, this message may be very difficult for someone in this church. The, the likelihood in a meeting this size that there is someone here who either has had an abortion or has been greatly affected by an abortion in their family or the surrounding people is very, very high. And uh, this is not uh, a sermon where I'm going to stomp and snort like I usually do. I'm, I'm, I'm going to the best of my ability, led by the Holy Spirit, be gentle and kind. But we need to understand the sanctity of human life. We need to understand it. Uh, we, we need to work through this in our lives. Over four decades ago, uh, President Ronald Reagan issued a proclamation on January the 13th of that year, 1984, designating January 22nd, 1984, as National Sanctity of Human Life. In, in the intervening years, the evangelical church has celebrated the third Sunday of January every year as Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Throughout the presidency of Mr. Reagan and then George H.W. Bush, there was an annual proclamation setting aside the Sunday closest to the 22nd as National Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Uh, under President Clinton, it was discontinued, uh, was restarted under the presidency, presidency of George W. Bush. It was continued again, uh, or discontinued again, under the president, presidency of President Obama. Uh, President Trump reissued that proclamation every year. And then not only has our current president discontinued the sanctity of Human Life Sunday, but he has vowed publicly that he will strengthen Roe versus Wade and he will make abortion on demand at any time available to women in our country. This, I, these are not my favorite kind of sermons to preach. And, and I preach this with a very humble heart. But I'm standing here and I can hear a pin drop in here. You're not rustling pages, you're not fumbling for things. Uh, I believe God needs his church to hear this and understand it. And it's a simple message. This is all I want to do. I want you to understand the sanctity of human life. I want you to understand the pro-abortion arguments. And then I want you to embrace the sanctity of human life. And then I want all of us as a church, as individuals, to protect the sanctity of human life. So let me read my text. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, God had called Jeremiah. The word of the Lord had come to him. God was getting ready to use him. Jeremiah even gives us the date. And then he says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. This is a central tenet of why I am pro-life to my core. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. 
I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Now, I'm going to tell you a story I've never told publicly before. This truth that God knew Jeremiah is so evident. I, I, I was four years old when Mama started me in school. And, and I, she took me to enroll me in kindergarten. And they told her, he's too young. He won't do well. And nobody told Bobby Jean Kendrick no. And when we left there, I was enrolled in kindergarten. And I can remember being sick one day at recess time. And, and Mrs. Strong, Mrs. Horton was my kindergarten teacher. Mrs. Horton uh, told me, lay your head on the desk. And I'll turn the lights out and you just wait. We'll only be gone about 20 minutes. And I was as scared of the dark as any kid has ever been. And I'm in, I'm in this kindergarten classroom. And, and I hear a voice. Now this was an audible voice. This wasn't a voice to my heart. I heard a voice that said, Terry, I will always be with you. And I thought it was the principal. I raised my head and looked around. There's nobody in the room. Of course, I didn't have an understanding of what that was. When I was 12, and I was not raised in a Christian home, and, and this was so foreign to me that and upset me so badly, I didn't know how to interpret this. But I was late going to school. My brothers and sisters had already gone, and I'm kind of rushing down Baltimore Street, And a dove flew right in my face. And it landed on my foot. And again, I heard a voice. Now this time I don't know if it was audible or if it was in my heart. But I heard a voice that said, Terry, everything's okay. I'm going to use you in this life. I wasn't saved. I had no training. I don't know. But here's what I know, having studied the scripture now for 50 years. Before I was ever born. Are you listening? Before you were ever born. God knew you. And he had a wonderful plan for your life. Now go to the book of Genesis with me, if you will. Genesis chapter 1. And I'm the pastor. I should be able to find that, shouldn't I? Verses 25 and 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, And over cattle, over all the earth, and every other creeping thing on the earth. So God created man in his own image. Male and female, he created them in the image of God. And then God blessed them and said, go forth and be fruitful, multiply. Let me walk through these three things with you. First of all. Let's understand the sanctity of human life. All life is created and authored by God. And therefore, it is sacred and should be honored by every human being and should be protected by every human being. When God says, I have created man in my own image and in my own likeness, He created us with with a body, with a soul, with a mind. And and he endowed us with with the ability to have knowledge. We're not created like anything else in all of creation. We are created in the very image of God. We are created for fellowship with God. And we are created for a purpose in God. And guys, over the years, there's been nearly 50 million abortions. And every child that's been aborted is created in the image of God, created to know God, created for fellowship with God. And in my opinion, and I believe it's true, when we take the life of an unborn baby, we are killing Someone God created for his own purpose. 
Now, there are three major arguments against the sanctity of human life. And I think we ought to know those. And I've categorized them in, in, in this way. One is the, the moral argument. And in the moral argument, those who are in the pro-abortion movement talk about the health of the mother and the cases of rape and incest. And, and they frame that in what is now known as the reproductive rights of women. So, so let's go through these arguments. And I want to give you sources for all these stats. But guys, a simple Google search, and you can find these very same things that I have here. Number one, the health of the mother. And most sites uh, talk about the health of the mother, and that makes up about 6% of all of the abortions in the USA. Uh, of those arguments, about 4% of those, 4% uh, of the 6%, or not 4% of the 6%, but 4% of the total of abortions are about the health of the baby. Some type of a birth defect some type of a problem with the baby, which leaves only 2% for the health of the mother. Now, included in that stat, folks, is the category of the mental health with the mother, that if she believes or the doctor believes that giving birth to this child will cause mental health issues, that becomes a reason to abort. So if you take the average number of abortions per year, which to the, to the shame of the United States of America, to the shame of God blessed America, is 1.2 million a year. And if you justify abortion on the basis of the health of the mother, that would only give 24,000 of that 1.2 million abortions. Now let that soak in. There are 1.2 abortions in God blessed America every year. One of the major arguments against the pro-life movement is we have to protect the health of the mother. And that would only account for 24,000 abortions. Now, listen, listen very carefully to me. And, and I want to be as sensitive as I can be. There are times when a doctor has to sit with a family and the family has to make a decision in, in, in this real moment of time, we have to choose whether we save mom or whether we save the baby. And I've been there with families and, and it's hurtful, it is painful, it is excruciating. Here on the one hand, we have this child that we've prayed for that we want. And we have mom and, and we have a wife, we have a daughter whom we've loved and known. And in a, in, a, in a blink of an eye, they have to decide who gets saved. Guys, that's not what abortion and God blessed America is all about. It isn't about the health of the mother. Doctors and families made those kind of decisions long before Roe Wade ever was approved. Listen carefully. The bulk of, of uh, abortions in America are for convenience, and because I don't want to deal with this responsibility. Let's look at rape and incest. And again, most sites agree that, that rape and incest and abortion, that it accounts for less than 1% of all abortions. Roughly 12% a year. And nobody that I've ever known in my life who is a child of God has ever denied the pain, tried to diminish the agony, uh, the trauma of rape and incest. 
Listen to me. As a therapist, I, I deal with the aftermath of, of childhood sexual abuse. I, I deal with the aftermath. My first, my first client when I was trained in trauma therapy was a lady who had been raped on the mall parking lot in Springfield. I, I get that pain. But if you take the health of the mother and rape and incest, and I'm not saying it's right to do abortions on those cases, but if you took those, we would re Reduce the average amount of abortions in God blessed America from 1.2 million a year to 36,000. How does that become the, uh, the moral argument? They, they also talk about the reproductive rights of women. And the question becomes does a woman have the right to end pregnancy based on reproductive rights. Uh, the major thrust in this is convenience. The convenience of the mother. And guys, somewhere between 93 and 97 percent of all abortions fall into this category. Uh, one Point one million of the 1.2 million. And guys, this stat blew me away. 47% of all abortions, nearly 600,000 per year, are for women who have already had a previous abortion. Now, the pro-life answer to the moral argument uh, is that God's creator, he's the creator of life, Life is his choice, and no one has the right to change that. Now, they, they have the scientific argument that they talk about. Basically, boiled down, the scientific argument comes to this one tenet, this one question. When does life begin? Uh, prior to Roe Wave, there was never a question that when a child was conceived in the womb, that it was a child, that its life mattered, and that it should be loved and cared for. Somewhere in this argument, the pro-abortion advocates have come to refer to life as only beginning after the baby is out of the womb and begins to breathe. They've, they've co-opted this issue by using terms like, not a child, not a baby, but a mass of tissue, the product of conception, a preborn human. When does life begin? This is a critical thing to understand. When does life begin? And listen to me very carefully, because I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm going to agree with most of you that says that the moment of conception, that is a life that belongs to God that should be protected from all of the evils that could come to it. But I'm going to tell you something further than that. Your life began. My life began long before I was conceived in my mother's womb. Before time began, before the creation of the world, I was known by the Heavenly Father. He had a plan for my life. He had a date and time when I would be born. He had a purpose for my life. And I was alive in God long before conception ever happened. And as a country, we have allowed nearly 50 million members of our population to have that life snuffed out before they ever came into the world. 
There's a spiritual argument they give also. Poverty. Why would you want a child to be born in the midst of poverty? And we do have a large culture of poverty in the United States of America. Some of it, for some people, it cannot be helped. For others, they could get out of the life of poverty if they had a desire to. But I agree with this argument. I, I don't want children born into poverty. I, I don't want children to come in and struggle. I don't want children to come into this life and learn the ins and outs of the culture of poverty and prolong that over and over again. But here's where this argument breaks down and you cannot use it justifiably. In God blessed America today, there are more families waiting on adoption than there are children being aborted. Now what does that tell you about the reason for abortion? Because a lady, if she doesn't want to raise a child or if they don't have funds, a lady can give birth and bless the lives of a family and of that child. Sweet Amanda Anderson, Amanda Dillsaver now, grew up with our kids, grew up in our church, was not able to conceive. Uh, many years she wanted a child. Uh, for whatever reason, she kept getting denied. And she called me one morning very early and said, I just got the letter. Josh and I have been approved. And another 18 months later, they were blessed with a baby boy. Changed their life. The mother of this child had to give this child up because she already had five children. And when her husband found out she was pregnant, he left. And she knew she could not raise this baby. But she already loved him. And she loved him enough that she could do the very best for him. And she handed him into the arms of a fine Christian young couple. And said, raise this boy. That's love. Now, I want to give you a second thing here, and that's to embrace the sanctity of life. There are many reasons why I embrace the sanctity of human life. And, and I'm going to give you the three major reasons. One is my personal experience. A young lady in uh, our church in Missouri uh, was raped. Uh, date rape, deal, drugs involved. And the result of that was the conception of a child. And uh, she took the ridicule of people trying to say, but probably wasn't rape. It, it probably wasn't wasn't uh, anything but her just doing what she wanted to do. And as a single mother, she walked through the process of birth and the beginning of raising a beautiful little girl. Now fast forward 25 years or so, maybe 30 years now, and there is a delightful intelligent young lady who loves the Lord that very easily someone could have justified this is not how I wanted to have my first child but when she found out she was pregnant she loved that child uh, there was a lady in our church that every year about the same time, she would nearly have 
a breakdown. And nobody knew why. Several times she had to be hospitalized. And one time her husband came to me and um, said, you know, preacher, it's, it's getting to be about that time. I don't know what I'm going to do. And he convinced her to come and talk to me. And as we talked, she talked about an abortion that she had had shortly after Roe Wade. She knew it was wrong when she did it, but she wasn't married. It was a day and age in which uh, that was such a scandal that she didn't want to endure that. And every year the pain of that abortion nearly broke her. My office as a therapist, when we began to pull back layers in, in trauma with people's lives. We come to this with ladies. And it is something that a lady seldomly gets over. I, I understand the pain. I've walked with ladies through it. Now, I've never had to walk through this with a man who wanted the baby and the wife aborted the baby anyway. I've never done that. But I assume that that is a deep pain. I, I am pro-life for spiritual beliefs. The things that I've already mentioned. The, the creation of God. Creating us with, with knowledge, with understanding, with the ability to live a full and meaningful life, with the purpose being us knowing Him. And I'm, uh, I'm pro life, and I seldomly ever mention this in a sermon, but I'm pro life by political belief as well. I believe somebody in God blessed America has to stand up and put a stop to this. And I, I never tell, try to, try to tell people, you vote for this candidate, you vote for that candidate, you vote for this party, you vote for this party. But I'm going to tell you right down to the dog catcher, I vote pro-life. And uh, I think it's important. And number three, I think we all should protect the sanctity of human life. Now, I won't pretend to know what that means for you. I'm not a marcher. I'm not a picketer. Um, and, and I believe those things do good work. I, I believe that every time we call attention to the need to protect the unborn, whether it's by carrying a sign outside of, a, of an abortion clinic, whether it's lying in the streets on a particular day and having a multitude out there, that's a wonderful thing. I have never been urged by God to do that. But I have been urged by God to lead the churches where I pastor to be pro-life. I have encouraged young ladies caught in the position of being an unwed mother, I've encouraged them to love that baby, whether that means raising that child or whether that means loving that child enough to put that child out for adoption. By the way, I would always recommend a Christian adoption agency, and I would always want to know that the family adopting that child have biblical beliefs in a Christian people. And I don't know what God's calling you to do, but I know he's calling every one of us to do something. And each one of us need to search our heart and ask, what is it, Lord, that I can do to protect the life of unborn children? Now, I want to leave you with one final thing. And uh, that is the amazing grace of God. If you're sitting here, as I talked about 
early in this service and there has already been an abortion in your life, you, you need to know that the amazing grace of God can be applied to your life. See, um, John writes to us in 1 John 1, 8 and 9, if we say we have no sin, we do not do the truth and we make God out to be a liar. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. And then there's this beautiful phrase he adds to it, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you've had an abortion and, and you, you have come to God and you have owned that, and you've asked God to forgive you, and you've turned away from that, you have been cleansed. And I hear people talk all the time, well, I just can't get past the guilt. Well, there's no more guilt. You've been set free from that guilt. Now, what we feel often is shame. I am ashamed that I did that. You know the major difference between guilt and shame? The major difference between guilt and shame is guilt says I did something bad. That gives us an opportunity to go to God and ask for forgiveness. But where guilt says I did something bad, shame says I am bad. Listen to me. As a saved, born again, child of God you can't be bad because on that moment or in that moment that you trusted Jesus Christ as your savior your sin that had been imputed to him on the cross of Calvary it is, is cleansed by his precious blood and the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to you now listen to me carefully Two things I want you to know. If you've never come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, run to him now. Don't wait. Don't, don't. Run right now. Confess him as your Savior. Trust him. Just, just say to him, I know that I've sinned and I know I need you. Come into my heart. Be my Savior. And, and, and when you say those kinds of words from the heart, the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And number two, if you've had an abortion and, and you don't feel set free from that, you go back to God again and you say to God, I know I did wrong. Please forgive me and cleanse me. And then add to that prayer, help me with my shame. Help me conquer it. And guys, that doesn't just go for abortion. That's any unconfessed sin that you have. As God convicts you, run to him. Now, we have a wonderful thing here called an invitation and I know there's some people say why don't we do this week after week after week some weeks even nobody even comes to the altar to pray Casey sitting right over yonder Casey's the reason we do that he came to church I don't think he was seeking God because the Holy Spirit was drawing him but I don't think Casey came that morning and said I'm going to go down the aisle and get saved this morning but as the invitation came the Holy Spirit drew him, and he came to know Jesus. And that's why I do it week after week after week. That's why no matter what scripture I read in the beginning and no matter what principles I teach you during the message, I come back to the cross of Jesus Christ because that's where salvation is. And that is a free offer to you today. I, I just can't understand not taking that. Bow your heads with me. Close your eyes. Actually, stand with me and close your eyes. Father, we're fixing to have this thing we call an invitation. 
And, and I've preached a very difficult message this morning. For some people, this may have been absolutely excruciating. And Father, I pray, I pray, I pray, I pray, I pray that those who are hurting will allow you to apply the balm of Gilead that only you can give to the soul. That they'll come to you for salvation, for forgiveness, for, for getting right with you. Have your way, Father, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.